Hello Church. Now sadly today we had a slight technical difficulty which means that we weren't able to record today's service but we did get the sound. So today it will just be the sound coming out to you but stay plugged in and keep listening to it because it's a mighty service where we explore more about what's just around the River Bend. So we apologise there's no officials today but the sound is mighty and you can still hear the word of God so enjoy. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome GCC. It is great to see you and to you at home. We, I believe it is great to see us, I'm sure. Now, we are loving being here in the building. And for those of you who haven't yet been, please, we encourage you, please come and join us. It is a great experience. I'm loving just standing here in our building. It's fantastic. On a summer's day like this, uh, this even feels a bit hot in here, doesn't it, guys? It's, it's a bit, ooh, you know, it's good. It's atmosphere. That's what's causing it, isn't it? That's, that's the heat. Well, it really is great to see such a full house. It's absolutely fantastic. And to see some faces that I've not seen for some time in person, it really does, yeah, warms, warms my heart. So um, it's great to see everyone. It really is absolutely fantastic. That's right, that's right. It really is good. <clears throat> now, as you know, you'll see from our slide that we have started a theme this month, What's Around the River Bend. We really want to get excited about the future and thinking about what's going to be happening in the future. So we want you to be part of that journey. And so we want to explore what that means, explore what God is saying in that moment under that theme about what's around the river bend, because we believe that God is always thinking about what's next. So I don't want to start preaching. That's, that's going to come. So we'll get to that. So let's just pray and then we're going to worship. Lord, we just want to commit today to you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have, Lord, uh, just to gather together like this. And we thank you for these moments, God, where we can just make you the center, make you the focus. So, Lord, we want to honor you today. We recognize that you are the one that unites us all. And, Lord, that under your name, your name, which is worthy of all praise and all honor, it is why we stand here. You unite us all. Where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are, you have said. So, Lord, we thank you for your presence. And, Lord, we just want to honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to hand over to the worship team and, uh, and we're going to go. All right. Enjoy. Also, for those of you at home, enjoy. Good morning. Um, if you've got your Bible with you, turn to Isaiah 43. As we start today, in, in my Bible, it's headed up, Israel's only saviour. And Isaiah was bringing the word of the Lord to the Israelites, and I think the word is the same for us today. It says, Now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Do you think of those stories that he's talking about that they experienced through the, the Red Sea and the um, God saving Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fire? I am, verse 3, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I give Egypt for your ransom, since you are precious and honoured in my sight and because I love you says, verse 5, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and the west. Remember, they'd all been scattered. Verse 7, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Let's go down to verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no saviour. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I and not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am the one, I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand when I act, who can reverse it. So there's reassurance that God is in control, he loves us, he knows us by name. As we bring our worship today, we're going to sing. Well, I've chosen a song, Sing and Shout. Go for it. <laughs> I've always, I've held back on this song because I thought, you can't shout out loud, but we can. It says, open your heart. 
to God so we can do open our hearts to God this morning. If you'd like to stand, if you're able to, please do.
we wash it when the spirit starts to move. Hello. Now we're just going to take time throughout our worship to break bread together. 
today. Now, if you're in the building, you will have one of these. And I know last time they were a little bit of a challenge to open. So just so you know, we are going to give you a little bit longer today. So no worries if you're struggling. And if you're at home, um, I hope you can join us today as we break bread and you've got your um, bread and juice ready to join us today. Now, we are coming to a time where restrictions are opening up. So we might be thinking about inviting people round for a meal um, and sort of being able to connect with people. Um, because a meal is a time where we can connect, where you can sit around a table and have that real moment of being together, where everybody around the table, you've got their full attention and you can share what you want to share. You can just spend some quality time together. And it's at a meal that Jesus chose to say to his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. Because you see, he knew it was about companionship. He knew it was about being together, spending time together around that table and telling them something that he wanted to impart into their life. A uh, tradition, a um, sort of a routine, if you like, that they would take into their lives and forevermore to remember everything Jesus has done for him. Because it's during the breaking of bread that we remember what Jesus has done, that he went to the cross for us, that his body was broken for us, that his blood was shed for us so that we can have that relationship with God, that we can personally go to God, we can personally talk to God and have that one-to-one -one relationship with our Heavenly Father, with the one that created us because of what Jesus has done. And Jesus did it as a thing of companionship. That why he was together, why people were together and spending time together, enjoying time together, he said, take this moment, take this moment to remember. So today, we're going to take this moment. We're going to take this moment to remember all that Jesus has done for us. So the band are going to play another song. And what I want to encourage you today is just to use this time to connect, to connect with God, connect with our Heavenly Father. And so while the song is playing, you can sort of fight with these if you're in the building and try to get them open and just take the bread and juice. And then once you've finished, just stand to your feet and join in the worship that the worship group will be doing for us. And at home, take this moment to connect. Connect with God. Connect with your heavenly Father. And thank him for all that he's done. Thank him for his son. Thank him for Jesus Christ that died on the cross for us today. So I'm going to pass back to the worship group. And guys, you take the top bit off first and get the um, wafer bread out, and then it's the juice underneath. But let's connect and remember what Jesus has done for us. Thank you, Jill.
in Christ alone. Father God, we just praise you today. We thank you for what you've done for us. And Jesus, we just come with our hearts full of praise and wonder. We are so thankful that you went to the cross for us. We are so thankful that you made it possible for us to have that relationship with our Heavenly Father. Our lives are changed because of what you've done. We are free because of what you have done. We can live a life that is so wonderful and free because of what you have done, and we thank you today. So today, we spend this time just connecting with you, our hearts full of praise and thanks for all that you have done. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, worship group. Now, before I invite Charles to come and talk to us, there's a couple of things I want to say. First, I want to say how great it is to see Anne in the house today. Anne, it's lovely having you here. We have been praying for Anne, and it is an absolute delight to see your face. It's good to have you here. Also, we have some more bread um, available this week. So on your way out, if you would like to take a loaf of bread, they are at the back. And then at the end of church today, do not rush away. We are going to be having teas and coffees just on the grass outside. So make sure you grab a cup and just help have a time of still connecting and being together. Because it'd be good to just have chat and see how we're all doing. So make sure you don't rush away at the end of church. The sun is shining. It's good to be outside. So let's be outside together. Now I'm going to hand over to Charles um, for today's message, carrying on with the theme of just around the River Bend. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Let me just give myself centering. Ah, there we go. So I can be right in front of the camera where I like to be, obviously. How... How are we doing? Can we hear me? Have I turned on correctly? Is it coming through? Yes, I believe it is. Excellent. Well, welcome again. Loving having you all here. It really is good. It really is good having you all here. So, I want to talk to you, as you know, on, under this theme of what's around the river bend, which is a, a favourite song of Becky's from a favourite Disney film, which I don't share. Now, I'm not particularly a Disney person. I have to be now. Just, you know, by nature of having children, kind of have to be. And I obviously grew up with Disney, and now I am reliving Disney, the new era of Disney. So, just around the river bend. And think about this whole idea of journey. Journeys are important. As Christians, we talk about the journey of faith, don't we? I've talked about that a lot, the journey of faith. The fact that this journey that we do, this relationship with God, is a journey. And some analogies are given to things like marathons, that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And some of, you are, some of you are like, yeah, it is a marathon, isn't it? You can feel like that sometimes, can't it? You hit that wall, and then you think, can I go any further? We know with God, we can. So I want to talk to you about the journey to purpose. And then we're going to look at the story of Elijah and Elisha. You might know it very well, you might not know it. Um, we don't necessarily have time to get into all of the details on it. We're going to look at a snapshot, which is really, in effect, a crossing over. It's a handing over time that's happening here with Elijah and Elisha. So the context here is that Elijah and Elisha, Elijah, prophet to the nation. Elisha is effectively his right-hand man, his heir apparent. And so the two, the two travel together. They journey together in ministry. But Elijah is the man. Elijah is the man at this point. He is the man. So in 2 Kings chapter 2. Now, the, the account comes from verses 1 to 18. I'm not going to read through all of those verses, just for time. But I'm just going to focus on just some aspects of those verses. So we're going to pick up some verses between 1 and 18 that, that highlight some of the things around this idea of the journey to purpose. Because Elijah and Elisha were on a journey at this point. Now, there was a difference, a juxtaposition of where they were in these positions. So Elijah and Elisha are together, but they're in two different positions. One is, is, is at the end of his journey. The other is, is kind of just in the early stages. He's the up-and-coming person. And this can, this can obviously have parallels for any one of us in different positions in our life in different times. Maybe for, for, for many we feel that we're more at one end than the other, but, but there are different points at which we may be at this stage where we're either at the beginning of a journey or we're maybe near the end of a journey. And for Elijah, he was nearing the end. So if we read here... Verses 1 and 2. 
It says, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. Now what I love about this is how it just comes in with this, when the Lord was going to take Elijah up into heaven in a whirlwind. Believe me, there's not a long account about this prior to this. There's not a lot of detail around, oh yeah, he's going to take him off in a whirlwind. It's just like, oh, that's what's going to happen. He's going to take him off into a whirlwind. Okay, we just accept that, we just absorb it and, and move on. It's that I, I love how the Bible deals with these things sometimes. So we know that Elijah is going off somewhere. He's going off to heaven in a whirlwind. We know how it's going to happen. Elijah knew this as well. So Elijah's on his journey with Elisha, understanding this is what's going to happen. So verse 2, Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said to him, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Bethel. Now I think there's a key aspect there, key words that are spoken, which are a theme throughout this account, which is not long, only 18 verses or so. I will not leave you as surely as the Lord lives, he says. Now we see here, I believe, that Elisha had a commitment. He had a commitment to Elijah. When we think about this idea of what's around the riverbend, this idea of what's around the riverbend is this idea of, well, what's coming next? We're on a journey, and what's going to come next around that corner of the journey? What will it be for us? I believe that in that, there needs to be certain aspects that we are about in this. It's not just a passive thing. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. It's not just a passive thing. So number one, Elisha had a commitment to the journey. He was committed to Elisha. As surely as the Lord lives, he says, I will not leave you. It's just, it's just not leaving him. It's, it's kind of, that's it. That's what he says. Now, I have some experience of this. I can even give you some very live experience, even from this morning. I have two young children, as you can see. Whether they're paying attention or not, we'll see. But uh, whether they listen to Daddy, not as, long, not as often as I was like. But there are certain moments, in particular the younger one, whose name will not be spoken, sometimes has this same position with us as parents, that we might be in a certain position. Maybe we need to get up and do something. We need to get up and do something. And the young one would decide, no, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to hang on to your arm, or I'm going to sit on your lap, or I'm going to just hold on to you. But I need to go and do this, sweetheart. No, no, no I'm just because he's committed to being with me, to cuddles, to anything like that, maybe wanting something, but usually just to be with us. Only this morning, she was committed to laying right by me, face to face like this, in bed. Just, you know, no room for me, just more concerned about, I need to have room, and I'm just going to be here. And as you know, she has big hair. That hair will often be part of the process of just being committed to being there. Just wash her out. But she is committed to just being with Daddy. Or Mummy. You know, either, either will do, either will do. Do we have that commitment to our journey with God? Are we that? I'm, I'm on this journey. I will not leave you. That's it. Or do we fade at times and think, well, this journey's a bit too tough. I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of a bit tired here. Well, Elisha wasn't. Elisha was energized by this determination. You see, he, was commit he committed himself to a person. He committed himself to the journey, but also to the person, ultimately, of Elijah. Because Elijah was his, his person, his leader, his person that he was looking to. And I think there's a key aspect here that we need to think about when we think about what's around the riverbend. Because we only get to what's around the riverbend if we commit to the journey. We only get there if we're committed to the journey. If we get off the, the, the boat or we get off the stream, we can't get to what's around the corner. We can't get to what God has for us. We see this example of this commitment in Ruth as well. A, a, a story here in chapter 1, verses 15 to 18. It says, Naomi, your sister-in-law, is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. And the context here is that Naomi has become a widow and has no children at this point because her husband died and her children also died. But one of the widows of her children, one of her sons, is still with her, which is Ruth. In verse 16, Ruth says, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you because Naomi's thinking, well, I've got nothing for you. I've got no husband. My children are dead, meaning one of you, your husband is dead. What more do I, I can't have, I can't have any more children. So you can't have any more husbands from me. I'm too old for that, she says. She even, she even says this. So she, she feels herself that she is of no use to Ruth any longer. But Ruth has a determination and a commitment to her. She says, do not urge me to leave you or to, or to stand back from you. Where you go, I will go. 
Where you stay, I will stay. And you will be my people, and your God, like this, will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely, even if death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. You know, it's like sometimes we do that with the kids. They say, oh, we just want to come with you. I just want to go and do this on my own, children. Even go to the toilet on my own, please. No, 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 I just want to... There comes, you have to draw the line, don't you? But, but there's a time where you just as a parent, you say, oh, you know, okay, fine, come, come, let's go, let's go. Well, you can come with me and do this. It's, it's fine, it's fine. It would maybe be easier not to, but you can come with me because they are committed to being with you. Ruth decided, okay, or Naomi decided, okay, Ruth is too committed. Elijah decided, okay, Elisha, come on in, we're going to Bethel, let's go. I've got to go and do this bit of business here. Remember, he's on an agenda, he's on a journey. Elijah's on a particular journey. Elijah knows what's around the river bend for him. Elisha doesn't. Not fully. He doesn't know what's on the, around the river bend for him. He just knows I've got to stay with Elijah. I've got to stay on this journey with Elijah. I've got to be committed. Another example of this commitment, another example where you have a clear decision to journey in life. In John, John chapter 6, verses 60 to 67. I'm going to read a few of them here. On hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? The context here is that Jesus had spoken about being the bread of life and saying that you need to eat from me. I mean, it's tough. When you read it, you think, wow, this is tough, heavy stuff to a crowd of disciples or who were apparently disciples. And he reads to them and he, and he talks to them and he says, look, you need to partake of me. You need to be committed to me, which means you need to eat and drink from me. I am your supply, Jesus says. Many of his disciples are like, whew, that's too much. It's too much. So we come to this point where they're saying it's too much. And it says that in verse 61... Of John 6, it says, Aware that his disciples were grumbling about him, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you, what he said? Then if you see me, the Son of Heaven, ascend to where he was before, the Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them who do not believe and which would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one comes to me unless the Father has enabled them. So Jesus had a hard word, and he understood there were some issues here, some grumbling amongst the disciples to say, well, oof, this is a bit tough, Jesus. You've confronted us with something here. It's a bit much. Whoa. And Jesus said, well, no, here's the deal. Verses 66 now to 69. From this, time, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So in other words, they were on the journey for a while when it was okay, when it was comfortable, when it seemed like it was... Yeah, okay, you're saying the right things. We're liking what you're saying. We're liking who you are. You've got a bit of charisma. You're exciting, etc. Now you've said something we don't like. Now you've said something that's a bit too tough. Now you've said something that's a bit too much for us. Isn't God like that sometimes? Doesn't he come to us with things that we think, whoa, God, that's a bit, that's a bit much. Really, if I, if I keep going here on this journey with you, this is what it means? Really, does it? I've been confronted with those things. And you step into it and you think, whoa, really God? But then God shows you what it really means. So Jesus was in this position where he said, well, are you going to leave me too? He says to the disciples, now I'm seeing all these people walking away. Are you going to? Here's their response. Verse 68. Do you want to leave me too? In verse 67 he says, and then this is when he's asking his 12 disciples, they're not just a big crowd, he's, he's his guys. Verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Who you have the words of eternal life. In other words, we're committed to you. Where else can we go? Who else is going to give us the words of eternal life? Who has what you have? Jesus. No one. So we're committed to you. We're going to do this journey with you no matter what. You've said this. Okay, it's, a, it's, it's ooh, that's big stuff. But we're still with you because you have the words of eternal life. You see, if we're going to get to what's around the river bend, we have to have this level of determination, this level of commitment to the journey and to the person, the person being God. We have to have this level of commitment. To whom shall we go? Where can we go? Where can we go? You turn people away who are desperate, who need, where else are they going to go? If they think, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? In other words, we will be committed to you, to life with you, no matter what. You see, I've made that commitment. Many of you have made that commitment too, haven't you? When you've made that decision to partner with somebody in life. I partnered with Becky. It was one of the biggest and best decisions I could ever make. 
Because when I was thinking about this idea of what's around the river bend for me, I wanted to do it with that journey with Becky. And I understood that, that, that it was important. And actually, this was even prophesied to me, actually, to give more even depth. Not specifically the, the name of Becky, but that actually the person who I would do life with would be integral, would be integral to my journey and my destiny in God. Heavy, isn't it? You know, a big, heavy responsibility for Becky. It's like, you know, it's a bit much. Is she, is she living up to that? You know, but definitely, definitely. God knew what he was doing. God understood what he was doing. So I had to make a commitment to a person and say, I'm going to do this journey of life. This was crucial. Understand this, those of you who are listening at home, those of you who are here who maybe have not got to that point, this decision of who you attach your life to is vital. It's vital. It would, dis- it would determine so much of where you go. So if you've made that decision to attach yourself to God, great. But then the other person, other people that you attach yourself to are also vital. It must be in line with that. It must, it must go alongside that in order to get to what's around the river bend for you. It has to. Number two, just thinking about this idea of the journey and what commitment you have to it. Verses 2, 4, and 6 of the original account we were talking here. We were looking at 2 Kings. So in 2 Kings 2, if you look at verses 2, 4, and 6, you see the same statement being made. The statement that I read in verse 2, where the response from Elijah, or the response from Elisha to Elijah is, I will not leave you, he repeats two more times. In verse 4 and verse 6, he repeats that. As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So in other words, Elijah's on his journey saying, do you know what? Um, Look, I've got something to do. I'm going to this next point. Uh, just stay here, I'll do it, and then I'll come back to you. But every time, Elijah's like, no, I'm coming with you. I'm with you. That's it. I'm with you. Do we have that commitment? Do we have that? You see, number two, Elijah, Elisha was tenacious and dogged in his mission. He was committed. It wasn't just that he was committed once, and then that was it. And then when it got too much, like some of the disciples with Jesus, he decided, you know what? Ooh, that's a bit, I'm off. No, he continued that. He was persistent in it. He did not leave for any reason. He said, I'm with you. Even though you're going here, I'm going there. Even though you're going over there, really, I'm going over there. Okay. I know that experience a little bit with shopping sometimes in the family context. You understand that in the family context, sometimes you're not directing the flow of shopping, are you? You're going certain with thing. Maybe the, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to generalise here, maybe men, I'll just generalise here, I'm, I am generalising, that men, sometimes we are, yes, I'm getting some acknowledgement there, we are kind of pulled along, aren't we, in, into a journey. And it's like, you're going to this shop? Um, okay, all right. And so, and so we settle in that shop and it's okay, all right. But then, but then all the decision gets made, we're going to this shop now. Really? We're going, okay, all right, we'll go to that shop, okay. And you, and you stop and you just, okay. At this point, nothing is, you're not engaged in anything. You're just, just doing the, then there's a third shop. You're like, okay, okay, I, I, we've done two now. Really a third? And depending on your situation, men, just, you know, there might be 10 shops still. I don't know. But the point is you have to have that commitment, don't you, to, to, to say, okay, I'm going to go on to the next one. Okay, all right. What else am I going to do? I'm going to go to the next one. Elisha was persistent. He went to the next place with Elijah. He had to go. And he did that. <clears throat> Proverbs 4, verses 26 to 27. Give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. So Proverbs advises us this whole idea of keeping your path and your path, your feet committed to the path. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Just stay, whatever the cost, whatever the cost. When you're thinking about what's around the river bay, and the implication is that you're just kind of being led upon, along the process, aren't you? Imagine this person on a river just saying, oh yeah, I'm just going along the river and, and whatever is around the river bend. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a determination, a purposeful, deliberate intention to be on a journey. Because you can decide to get off the boat or, or, or off the bus or off the train if you don't want to do that journey. You can do that. But what we're saying is, is that Elisha didn't do that. He said, I'm on the train, I'm on the bus, I'm on the journey, that's it. And I'm with this person and I'm doing this, that's it. And he continued to repeat that commitment. It's about being purposeful. So number one, he was committed. Number two, he was consistently committed. Number three, he had a holy ambition. He had an ambition in it. So we see this agenda, we see this agenda captured here. Because you think to yourself, okay, well... He's committed, isn't he? That's good. Yeah, he's committed. But I believe we also see, I think we also see there was a, a, something he had an understanding of, which was this. We're going to come to this. 
verses 9 and 10. It says, When they had crossed Elijah, so when they had crossed, Elijah and Elisha, tell me what I can do for you. So they had crossed the river. And he says, Tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken from you. So I'm not going to be here for much longer. What can I do for you while I'm, you know, while I'm here? Get, 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 get what you need to get while it's good. While I'm here, just get something from me. Verse 10, he says, You have asked a difficult thing. Sorry, verse 9, sorry, coming back to it. He says, his answer, Elisha's answer is, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Elijah understood. Elisha understood that Elijah carried something because he'd walked with him and he'd seen what he'd done. He'd been there. When we talk about the things that Elijah did, when you read the accounts of what Elijah did, remember, think in your, in your context that Elisha was there watching these things happen. So he understood that Elijah carried power and anointing from God. He understood that. So Elijah's response to him is, you have asked a difficult thing. Because he had. Big stuff. He didn't want just the, the, the equal anointing. He wanted double. Can I have more, please? Can I have two scoops of ice cream instead of one? It's like, you know, it's what the kids ask for, don't they? There's two scoops of ice cream. That's massive. That's, that's five quid. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not paying that. You know, so. Two scoops he wanted. This is, not, this is too much. It says, this is difficult. Yet you have seen me. It says, yet if you see me, when I'm taken, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. What I find interesting about this is that he was committed to the journey. He was committed to the person. What's around the riverbed? Whatever's around the riverbed, I'm committed to, is what Elijah was saying. And yet, having already said this numerous times, so verses 2, 4, and 6, he's already said, I'm on the journey. Only now, in verses 9 and 10, do we get to the point where he says, well... As I'm on this journey, I, could, I, could I have this, please? I find that interesting. He didn't ask it first, can I have this, and then commit. He committed first and then said, can I have this, please? So Elijah knew whether he asked anything or not, he was committed to him. Because he hadn't asked for anything at this point. He just said, I'm with you. I'm just, I'm with you. Sometimes we get the cart before the horse. We want the thing, the answer, before we make the commitment. Before we say, okay, God, I'm in. We want this first. So, oh, God, if you can just do this, please. And God say, no, just commit to me. Just be faithful to me. Sometimes we make requests and demands, don't we, before we can, we can pay the price. So like going into a shop and saying, can I have that, please? And then you ask the price. You've not thought about the price. You've just thought, I want that thing. And then you hear the price and you're like, whoa, okay. We've all done that, haven't we? not the best way to do things. It's good to know the price, isn't it, before you go to buy the item, before you ask for it. Elijah and Elisha, this exchange is happening between them. Elisha understood the cost, but he was prepared to pay a price before he even asked for anything. He knew the cost. I've got to just commit to this journey. And as I'm on this journey, I'm going to ask. I'm going to be bold. He had this holy ambition, which was that I want to have a double anointing, a double portion of what Elijah has. In other words, he wanted more of God. He was seeking more of God. He said, I've got this much, but I, I know I'm heading to something that's going to be too much for me. It's too big for me. I need more. And so from Elijah, I need more of what you have. I want, it. I want what he's got. You know, when you're in a restaurant and you look at somebody's meal and you think, oh, I'd like that. I'd like to look at that meal. We can kind of do that now, can't we, a little bit? We can get into that and we start looking at other people's meals and other people's desserts. We think, oh, why didn't I get that? Elijah's like, I want... More of what you've got, Elijah. I want double of what you've got. There was a boldness about him. So number three, he had a holy ambition in this journey, in his commitment. There was a commitment. There was a holy ambition, an ambition. Do we have that ambition ourselves? Or are we just passive? Like, well, whatever happens, happens. We'll just... Now look, let's be honest. We're not always in control of everything. If you are a control freak here today or at home, if you're a control freak, sometimes the things that aren't in your control are the things that upset you the most, aren't they? Things, money, job, bosses, children, it's just, it just winds you up. But maybe if you're some, one of those people that just, oh, it's okay, whatever happens, happens, these things don't stress you. The point remains, we need, still need to have a commitment and be purposeful in what we're doing. And when we're talking about this journey, we're not talking about being passive, we're talking about being purposeful. Elisha was purposeful in his commitment to the journey. He, he dared to believe for more. 
When you look at the prayer of Jabez, there's a classic example here, 1 Chronicles 4, verse 10. Many of you will know it. If you don't know it, I'm going to read it for you very quickly. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will not, so I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. This is, this is the stuff maybe when we're this bold with requests. We associate with children, don't we? Children make big requests and they just never, they maybe don't fully understand what it means. And when you get to an adult, you kind of realise, well, I probably shouldn't ask that. It's a bit much, it's a bit cheeky, it's, it's too much, and, you know, that's not going to happen. God's, what does God say? What did Jesus say about how our faith should be, how we should come to him? What did he say? He should come to me as a, as a child. Because a child has that sense of just, well, I'm going to ask. Because I see that, and I, I see it's possible, so I'm just going to ask. I want to have the attitude with God. So I'll just ask. I'll just ask with a level of ambition. And finally, number four, we see that he was rewarded. He was rewarded. Elisha was rewarded. Verses 13 and 14. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him. So at this point, he's already been taken. With the verses where he's been gone, you read for yourself, he's gone. Whoosh, he's gone. So Elijah's seen, Elijah's seen this happen. He's seen Elijah go. It's, it's a scary experience. And he's like, whoa. And then we get to verse 13. He says, Elijah then, Elisha, sorry, then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Now, prior in, previously in the story, Elijah had gone to the bank and just put his coat on it, it parted for him and they'd walked through. The two of them had walked through. So Elijah had seen this. He'd seen this happen. He'd seen this incredible thing that we've already read about. The parting of the Red Sea. Well, a smaller example here is this. Elijah just kind of did it. He didn't, there was no great kind of, he just did it. Put his coat, parted it. Elijah's seen this. So Elijah's now coming back to this point and he's, he, he, Elijah's gone now. And he's in this place of loss and desperation and feeling alone. And it says in verse 14, he took his cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. It says, where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. In other words, where are you now, God? Elijah's gone. I'm on my own. Where are you now? Are you going to show up? Is this it now? And then we read, when he struck the water, it divided to the right and the left and he crossed over crossed over. So at this point there was a realisation Elijah had sorry, Elisha had, a realisation that power has passed to me. Power has passed to me. The parting of the water was a direct sign that the power had passed to him. Now, the thing we need to understand here is that the request that he made to Elijah, it wasn't Elijah's to actually be able to fulfil. Elijah couldn't fulfil that, only God could. Because Elijah was too busy being whisked away. It was God who, who ultimately gave the exchange of power from Elijah to Elisha. It was God who fulfilled that request. God was listening when Elisha made that request. God is listening when you make that request, when you make that, that, that plea to him. God is listening. Even when you ask, you know, can I have this loan, please? Or can we have this, this thing, please? Or can you... It's God who's listening. If we're on this journey of faith, we understand that God is listening. Not about the person who's right in front of us. It's about God who's listening. And so for Elisha, God was listening and God answered his prayer. So number four, he was rewarded for his commitment and his commitment and his boldness in the journey because he dared to ask. He was rewarded for that. So even as I say this to you, just as we, as we, as we just finish now, even, if I, even as I say this to you, I say this to myself, or even God has been challenging me on this recently, this idea of just what we believe for and what we would dare to ask for and what commitment do we have to the journey with God. We've, Becky and I have had to have some commitment recently to the journey of, of, of being pastors of this church. We've had to have some commitment to that. As you know, we've had to be a bit determined, a bit like, okay, we're going to go again and we're going to continue and we're going to... And we're now in, in part of that phase of part of the payoff for that. Only the beginnings of that. Part of the payoff is that we're here. Because God brought us here. Thus far, God has brought us. God understands your heart. He understands your prayer. He understands your needs. He understands the questions you have, your struggles. He knows all of that. Like I know. He's on the journey with you. Are you on the journey with him? Are you committed to the journey with him? What we are is we're left with a few things, a few conclusions here that we need to remember, I believe, about thinking again about this idea of what's around the river bend, what's required maybe in that process. It is not just passive, it is active. Firstly, number one, we need to commit to the journey. If we're going to get to round the river bend, we have to commit to the journey. We don't get to round the river bend if we don't commit to the journey. It's kind of obvious, really, but we need to do it. 
Maybe you're here today and you're kind of thinking, well, what's around the river bend? But you've not yet committed to... You've not yet committed. Not really. Maybe you need to do that today. Number two, you need to be persistent and consistent in your commitment. Not just commit for now, and then if it gets a bit, then, oh, you know. Because trust me, we could have just walked away ourselves. We didn't want to walk away, but if we could have, could have done that, because you think, oh, this is too tough, this is too difficult. But that was, it was, for us, it was like Jesus and the disciples. And where, where, are we, where else are we going to go? We, we're committed to this. We're called to this. We have to do this. We, we, we just have to do this. We have, we want to do this. We're just committed to this. The disciples were committed to Jesus. Ruth was committed to Naomi. Elijah, sorry, Elisha was committed to Elijah. We just made that commitment. Say, I'm in. I'm in. We pray that you are in. Number three. So number two, you had to be persistent and consistent in that commitment. Number three, he needed to have, I believe, a holy ambition. Something that dared to believe for more. Where, as a church, we need to dare to believe for more. Because there are challenges, there are things coming out ahead of us that we're going to be talking about that mean we're going to need to believe for more. It's going to push our boundaries, it's going to stretch us. Which means we're going to need to believe for more. That holy ambition that drives our journey with him. Because we're pushing towards something. Elijah, I believe, in his mind, the subtext for him was, well, I'm going to stick with Elijah because I know I want something and I can get something here. But it was about that anointing. That anointing was so that he could fulfill the purpose of God, the call of God on his life. Because he knew it was his turn soon. He knew his, his time was coming, so he committed. Number three, he had to have that holy ambition. Number four, understand that we will be rewarded for our commitment and our boldness. Because it's God. Because we dare to ask, because we dare to believe, because we dare to commit. God will reward our commitment. There's a song that I remember from, from a childhood. We will not be like those of Ephraim who turned away when the heat of the battle came. I will arise, I will move on. Some here might remember that. I was very young when it was out, by the way. So, so yeah, just to clarify that for those who remember it. And the story there talks about those who were in battle who walked away when the heat of the battle came. And they did not achieve the victory because they walked away. That's what that song talks about. It quotes it's from the Bible. And the count there. Let's not be those who get off the journey before we've got to around the river bend and we don't see what God has for us because we just, we just couldn't take it anymore. So just as I finish here, I want us to pray in a moment because I believe, as I was even thinking about this, the one thing that God really struck through for me was this idea of this boldness to believe for something. So let's just stand, just very quickly, just to stand. We're just going to take a moment to pray. Those of you at home, if you want to stand, you can stand. Or if you want to stay sitting, that's fine. But I just want you to engage in this process just now, very quickly, before we, before we do our, 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 last, our last things. You see, I hope maybe God is believing or God is speaking to some of you about this idea of your commitment to the process and to being committed to and daring to believe for things. Maybe for some of you here, or if you're at home, you may have accepted your lot. Things have happened. And there's things that you maybe have had to accept, because it's just like, well, what, am I, what else am I going to do? But there's a limit to that. In God, there is a limit to that. I say it to myself. In, in God, there is a limit to how much we just say, oh, you know what, that's just, that's just how it is. God is saying, no, 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 it's not just how it is. I, I have more. I can go beyond the what is now. I can go beyond, and you can go beyond with me. You don't have to just stop and just think, okay, whatever. No, you can believe for more. So very quickly, even as those at home, I want you to just do this. We're just going to do this. I'm going to read the prayer of Jabez. And I just want us to pray just now. And I want you to take that on. You don't have to um, say it with me, but you can in your heart say it with you. If you want to, if you believe, if you're going to make a commitment to say, okay, I'm going to believe for what's around the river bend. I'm going to believe for something more. Not because of me, but because of God and who God is. Just going to take a moment to do that. So I'm going to read this just as we pray. Those of you at home, if you want to do this as well, please just engage in this moment as I just, as I just read out this prayer, the prayer of Jabez. He said this, he said, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. I'm going to read that once more. Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. 
Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm, so that I will not be free, so that I will be free from pain. Even as you're here today, even if you're here at home, I really want you to have taken that prayer on and that boldness on to say, Lord, that you would bless me. Because God is able, God is willing, and God is wanting that request, wanting you to come to him with that request, to believe for more, because of who he is. Because of who he is. We're talking about what's around the riverbend. There needs to be that boldness for what's around the riverbend. I believe God wants us to raise our expectations. I, want, I believe he wants us to raise our levels of faith. I say it to myself as I'm saying it to you. Let's just pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that, Lord, you have shown us a way, a way forward. And you show us step by step and you give us, Lord, your guidance. Lord, we pray that you will continue to give us your guidance. You will continue to inspire us. You will continue to direct us. And Lord, you would lift our level, God. Because we know you are capable of so much more. But Lord, lift our level to understand and, and to truly step into what you have for us about what's around the river, Ben. Lord, that we commit again today to the journey with you. That we are in. And we're just going to go from step to step with you. In step with you. That we as a church will go in step with you. That we will, pers- we will press forward into your purpose. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, everyone. I'm going to hand over to the worship band for our last song. I pray that you have truly been uh, blessed. And you will know something of the reward of what you have asked for today. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Let's finish our time together with a song that talks about God's amazing grace. Not because of we need to do anything other than acknowledge him as our saviour. It's all by grace.
Thank you. Well, it's been great having you all here. And for those of you at home, it's been great that you've been able to plug into us. Stick around. It's a summer's day. We're going to be here for a little while. Teas and coffees are going to be served over to my left, um, outside on the grass there. Um, so please come and just share with us a little while in the sunshine. And thanks for being with us. And we will see you again. If you are have not booked in yet, you've not been able to be here, please come and book in with us, book in with Louise. We'd love to see you. It's been great seeing people today we haven't seen for some time. For those of you who we haven't seen, come and book in. And guys, we will see you again very soon. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen.